Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I must say I'm very grateful to Francoise and the museum for inviting me to be here today because for many years I've wanted to come to the Royal Tyrrell Museum. In fact, I first knew of it when Phil Curry asked me in the early 1980s if he could have a cast of a saber-toothed cat skeleton to put on display at the Tyrrell Museum. And I thought, well, Tyrrell Museum, dinosaurs and saber-toothed cats is a place that you have to go. Um, but uh, unfortunately, circumstances have conspired against me, and this is the first time I've actually been able to visit the museum. So I'm greatly looking forward to seeing more of the museum after the talk. But in order to, to sing for my supper, as it were, um, I'm going to talk this morning about another fascinating uh, fossil locality of the Rancho La Brea or the La Brea Tar Pits. Just to put you in perspective, uh, the La Brea Tar Pits is about 2,000 kilometers south of here. It's a three-hour flight or a 24-hour drive. The name Rancho La Brea comes from the old Mexican land grant of Rancho La Brea, which was one square league in extent and was located one league that is seven miles west of the Pueblo of Los Angeles. The Rancho La Brea means tar ranch, and it got its name from the asphalt seeps that were seeping out in its southern border. And these were first documented by the Portuguese uh, do Portola expedition in 1769. Now Rancho La Brea includes uh, much of Hollywood and Hancock Park and Beverly Hills and is totally built over except for 23 acres along the southern border uh, which are where the remains of the asphalt seeps, the La Brea tar pits, are located. Rancho La Brea is the type locality of the Rancho La Brea and land mammal age. That means it's the, the type locality for, in North America for the last 200,000 years of the Ice Age, ever since bison migrated into North America. And from the asphalt seeps of Rancho La Brea, we have recovered more than three and a half million fossils which represent more than 600 species of animals and plants. Uh, the seeps come up from oil reservoirs which occur in late Miocene sedimentary rocks somewhere between uh, 1,000 and 10,000 feet below the surface. And as the asphalt migrates upwards from the oil field and seeps onto the surface, it traps unwary animals in the surface seeps. And here's an example of some animals trapped fairly recently. Um, dragonflies, spiders, rabbits, waxwings, birds, squ squirrels, and a goat. The thing is that the asphalt seeps can be very sticky, particularly when the temperature is above 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And it only takes an inch and a half to two inches to totally mobilize an animal the size of a horse or, or a cow. And so unwary animals stepping into the oil, asphalt seeps get trapped like flies on flypaper and they're, they're immobilized. And if they're lucky, uh, in a week or 10 days, they'll die of hunger or thirst. If they're not so lucky, they'll be torn apart by other animals that come in to feed from them. And this is the scenario that you had during the late Pleistocene at Rancho La Brea. So the animals were, were, were trapped in the asphalt seeps and were, were, uh, were, were torn apart by um, animals that came in to feed on them. And over time, these built up great, or apparently built up great conical masses of bones uh, that, that are now uh, called the La Brea tar pits. Asphalt from the tar pits was used by Native Americans and, and early settlers for many domestic purposes. The, the Native Americans used it for lining baskets, caulking plank canoes, 
and as an adhesive for necklaces or for sticking uh, fishing hooks onto fishing lines. And the early European settlers used it for fuel and for uh, putting on the roofs of their houses. And then in the late 1800s, it started to be mined to be used for cementing cobblestones onto roads and uh, impregnating wood, railroad sleepers, and, and so on and so forth. And the, the big asphalt mine was on the edge of Rancho La Brea, owned by the Hancock family. And the first fossils were discovered at, in that mine. Uh, what had happened is over the years, they'd, as they were digging out asphalt, they came across bones and they thought these were the remains of domestic animals, cattle and sheep that had inadvertently fallen and got trapped by the, the asphalt. But then William Denton, a professor from Wellesley College, had heard about the tar pits and he went down to see for himself and the landowner presented him with the canine of a saber-toothed cat, whereupon they realized these weren't just domestic animals in the asphalt seeps, these were fossils. And unfortunately, uh, although William Denton published on this, this, the, these findings, nobody took any notice of him. Largely, I think, because he and his wife uh, said that the, the bones talked to them. And uh, he was sort of rather dismissed a, a, as, as a, a bit of a, a weird English eccentric. And uh, sadly, he, he then traveled to, to Indonesia and he perished in the Krakatoa explosions. But bones were, were started to be found again and were recovered in the early 1900s as people started prospecting for oil and came across the bones in the asphalt seeps. The first excavations were by UC Berkeley in 1906, and they later excavated in 1912 and 1913. And then the Southern California Cannery of Sciences started excavations there for two years. And the bones that they recovered were one of the reasons for the founding for the LA County Museum. And then when the LA County Museum had been uh, built in 1913, the landowner gave permission to the LA County Museum to excavate at the tar pits for two years. And during those two years, they dug 100 excavations and recovered well over a million bones. Uh, this is a, a map of uh, uh, Hancock Park today. Um, the Page Museum is here. This is the Art Museum. And you, you still see the remains of some of of the old pits. This is the old asphalt quarry that was mined, and here are some of the other pits that are still in existence and can still be seen today. Uh, this is what they look like. This is the remains of the old asphalt quarry. Pit 9 and Pit 13 were excavated in 1913, and Pit 91 was found in 1915 and just started to be excavated in the 1960s. So there were three, three main phases of collecting um, from the tar pits by the LA County Museum. The 1913 to 1915 excavations, and then the pit 91 excavation in 1969 through 2006, and then the project 23 excavations from 2008 to the present day. This is what the La Brea tar pits looked like in 1914. Uh, this is pit 67, which has been flooded and you can see in the background the derricks from the oil field, which is the source of the asphalt from these, for these fossil localities. Um, this is pit 67 before it got flooded, and the excavators divided the area into three-foot square grids, and they excavated six inches at a time, and they kept records of that, so you have a fairly good record of where the individual fossils came from. Uh, as you can see, they, sometimes they went down to great depth, I guess the deepest was about 30 feet, and they didn't shore up the sides so that periodically there were collapses, particularly when it rained, and uh, that, that tended to mix up bones from different levels. These are some of the activities. The bones were taken out of the pits. They were cleaned on the spot by boiling them in kerosene, and then they were transported to the LA County Museum. And this is a, a photograph of the basement of the LA County Museum 
with uh, the remains of the Smilodon collection uh, there. As you can see, that there we've got lots of bones. Uh, but unfortunately, these are nearly all isolated bones. Uh, there are very few associated skeletons. And so although we have well over a million, a million bones recovered from the tar pits, the number of actual skeletons you can count on the fingers of two hands. During the 1913-15 excavations, um, they recovered about 300 different species of animals and plants, 29 species of plants, 63 insects, 133 birds, and 43 mammals. But most of the attention subsequently was paid to the mammals. The La Brea herbivores included the elephant relatives, the Colombian mammoth, and the slightly smaller American mastodon, two species of camel, the western camel and the long-headed llama, at least two species of ground sloth, the browsing Shasta ground sloth and the grazing Harlands ground sloth, two species of bison, the longhorned bison laticornis and the more short-horned um, bison antiquus, the flat-headed peccary, a couple of species of, of pronghorn, a couple of species of horse, and as a rare in, uh, occurrence, t um, the California tapir. But these were far outnumbered by bones of the carnivores that fed on them. Uh, they included the short-faced bear, which was about the size of a, a Kodiak bear, but very long-limbed, and, and then was the largest carnivore from Rancho La Brea. The commonest carnivore was the, the dire wolf, which was built much like a timber wolf, except it was, was much more massive. It was like a timber wolf on steroids. Um, then, more fearsome, you had the saber-toothed cat, Smilodon fatalis, which is about the size of a, an African lion, but weighed as much as, as a Siberian tiger. And you have um, Panthera atrox, which is usually called the American lion, which is about two-thirds, well, a third again, larger than an African lion, and is probably actually more closely related to a jaguar than to, to lions. And of course, you have the, the, the species that still persist today, the coyotes and the bobcats and so on. The Rancho La Brea fossils are dominant, both the birds and mammals are dominated by carnivores. Uh, of the mammals, well over 80% are carnivores, of the birds, well over 60% are birds of prey. And the only way we can explain this is that the asphalt seeps acted like a carnivore trap. And herbivores got stuck on the surface like flies on fly paper. And these attracted carnivores and scavengers, which in turn became trapped. And this little scene from a, a mural by Mark Hallett gives the the representation that we have in the collection. That is, for every herbivore, you've got uh, a coyote, two uh, saber-toothed cats, and three to four direwolves. So to give you some indication, we have well over 4,000 uh, individuals of direwolves, well over 2,000 individuals of saber-toothed cats, and more than 1,000 um, coyotes. Because you've got such large samples, this is very good for interpreting uh, how the animals grew and matured. For example, in the top here, you've got um, the palate of a, of a saber-toothed cat kitten with the milk ca canines sticking out. And then you go through progressively more mature specimens. The permanent canine is just coming through. The permanent canine is now bigger than the milk canine and the permanent canine has entirely replaced the, the, the permanent canine, the milk canine. And then you also, uh, <laughs> you've got a contrast between the first tooth in the Columbian mammoth jaw and the last tooth. Large samples also help you to document sexual dimorphism. For example, in bison, males have much longer and much stouter horns than females. Or in the turkeys, the males have spines on their legs, whereas females don't. And large samples also help you document pathologies of the past. Here we've got the saber-toothed 
cat skull where the canines were broken off and then worn down as the animal continued to live. You have fused neck vertebrae, fused lumbar vertebrae, fused toe bones where the animal got stepped on, healed ribs, and so on. Altogether, there are well more than 10,000 10, pathologic specimens in the collection. And at one time, it was thought that perhaps the tar pits were a site where injured animals came to, injured carnivores came to feed because they couldn't catch others. Um, but the actual number of pathologic specimens is only about 1% of the biotas, which is kind of what you'd expect in a normal population. Because we got so many bison jaws, uh, we can actually, I mean, actually document that the f fact there was migration going on. Because if you look at the, the bison jaws, they're either Four, uh, two to four months old, or they're 14 to 16 months old, or they're 26 to 28 months old, or they're fully adult, which means that the bison were in fact only present in this locality for a short period of time each year. Whereas if you look at the, the horse remains, the, 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 the animals are represented by all stages of life and not just periodic intervals. The 1913 to 1915 excavations focused on the larger specimens, such as this, um, oops, such as this uh, Harlan's ground sloth specimen found here. But we now know, of course, that it's not the larger species that provide the most useful environmental s situation, but the smallest. Uh, large species like saber-toothed cats, mammoths, dire wolves, horses, camels, will wander for miles during the course of their life and just happen to die at the La Brea tar pits. Whereas the smaller species, the insects, the snakes, the lizards, the mice, um, actually lived in the neighborhood of the tar pits all their life. And so in 19, this is where pit 91 comes in. Pit 91 was actually discovered in 1915 and it was worked for three, three weeks, and then it was decided that we'd leave it for a site museum, showing the public how fossils occurred in the ground. Well, like many museum projects, this one actually never got funded, and so uh, when they did build a site museum, they used a different place entirely. So in the 1960s, when we were looking for another site to excavate just to collect all the fossils, and not just the big ones, uh, Pit 91 was already there, and so uh, we, we made use of that. So in, on June the 13th, 1969, which is engraved in the Page Museum lore as Asphalt Friday, um, the, we started the, the re-excavation of Pit 91 with the intention of taking out all the fossils and not just the larger ones. And to date, uh, we've reached 15 feet below the surface, and people excavate by, by, um, from planks that are extended across the surface of the asphalt deposit because uh, that's to avoid actually treading on the bones that you're, you're collecting. And the bones are exposed, plotted, and then removed for cleaning, and the surrounding matrix is collected for processing microfossils. And during the course of the last 40 years, uh, we've added well over 300 species to the La Brea biota. Um, we've added 18 more mammals, mainly smaller ones like rodents, um, but we've also added 131 species of plants, 88 species of insects, and 63 species of mollusks. And so Pit 91 provides us a very good indication of what the life was like in Los Angeles 27,000 years ago. And it provides information about the local habitats, the way the fossils were preserved, and who ate who, what, or whom. Uh, the dominant Pleistocene habitat 27,000 years ago was sagebrush scrub. Um, this included sagebrush, sage, and saltbush with valley oaks, Monterey pines, cypress, and juniper, and was inhabited by grazing animals, the bison, bison, horses, camels, 
and the grazing ground sloth and the animals that fed off them, the saber-toothed cats, the direwolves, the coyotes, and the American lions. Riparian woodland was present near the major rivers, and this was composed of sycamore, arroyo, willow, elderberry, and so on. And in those riparian habitats, you would have the peccaries, the browsing ground sloths, and the mastodons. And up on the hills behind uh, La Brea, you, have, you had chaparral vegetation, including chemise, wild lilac, scrub oak, manzanita, and walnut. And some of these remains of some of these plants, like manzanita berries, were washed down from the hills and in, in streams and ended up in, on, on top of the asphalt seeps. Bone damage from Pit 91 is very rare, suggesting that the bones were covered quickly by asphalt. You don't have many signs of weathering or tooth marks or water wear. What you do find on many bones from all of the localities are grooves and furrows that are known as pit wear. And this is because um, the bones are so tightly packed that when earthquakes happen, the bones rub against each other and they wear grooves and furrows in, in each other. So the, the pit wear is paleontological evidence of earthquakes. I said that there were very few um, gnaw marks or, 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 or tooth marks. And that it seems to be uh, counterintuitive if the asphalt seeps were actually uh, an asphaltic trap. But um, there is some, doc some support for that from the fact uh, that we have an skeletal representation anomaly. That is, for each skull that we find in Pit 91, we have only one head, well, we have one head, obviously, but we only have one forelimb and one hind limb, which suggests that the free limbs were removed by scavengers or predators, but the mired limb, mild limbs were left behind. The, the, the bones from, from Rancho La Brea are, are very well preserved, which is, renders them very good for radiometric dating and for isotopic studies. And the isotopic studies help determine the food chain. Um, we analyzed a number of different species for, for uh, nitrogen-15, and there was a clear difference between the non-ruminants, such as mastodons and, and horses, and the ruminants, such as camels and bison, and the carnivores. Now, normally, uh, there's a... a jump in the, in the nitrogen composition as you go up the steps in the food chain. And this is about four parts per mil. And if you will go four parts per mil down from the carnivores to the next people in the food chain, you find that they hit the ruminants, but they don't hit the non-ruminants. And so this wonderful um, representation by Mark Hallett's of Smilodon feeding on horses is, is probably wrong. And smilodons were not feeding on horses or mastodons, but they were feeding on bison and camels. We got so much information out of Pit 91 that I'd often thought that it would be wonderful to be able to go back and re-excavate at some of these earlier sites and take out all the fossils and not just the big ones. But of course, that's not, no longer possible. But coming to our rescue uh, was our, what we think of, of the, the evil empire across the park, the LA County Museum of Art. This is the Page Museum. This is the LA County Museum of Art. Uh, initially, the Hancock Park was administered by the Natural History Museum. And the art museum said, if we could have just one tiny corner, we would uh, promise not to expand. And uh, <laughs> so. That's it. But uh, in the course of their expansion, their recent expansion, the art museum bought the May Company next door to, to itself and also the May Company parking structure. And it decided it would be environmentally more friendly if it replaced the parking structure with an underground parking structure. 
and that involved digging a big hole for the underground parking structure. And if you big, dig a big hole next door to the world's richest Ice Age fossil site, you're likely to find the odd bone or two. And that was, in fact, the case. Here you can see the art museum. This is Curzon Avenue. That's the parking structure. It's the art museum, the road, the, uh, where the parking structure was. And, you, and they recovered, or they documented, at least 16 new fossil deposits there in 2006. Well, they didn't allow us to excavate those fossil deposits on site because that would have slowed the, um, the progress of the cons construction. So instead, oh, well, let me just, just I indicate that this is a, a section through the ground to show the depth of the individual fossil deposits. And you'll note that they're all between 10 and 25 feet below the ground. So they wouldn't have got, this is why they weren't discovered by the, the early prospectors. And they wouldn't, in fact, have been found unless the art museum dug this hole. So when, when we found a fossil deposit, the edges were, were clearly demarcated. And then we started to clear away the, the dirt from the edges of the deposits, starting off with hand tools and ending up with, with large constructions. And so here, here's a fossiliferous deposit isolated. And then those fossil deposits were wrapped with, with plastic and boxes and crates built around them. And this is the largest crate. It's, it measures 20 feet by 12 feet by 10 feet tall and weighed 125,000 pounds. And then <coughs> they were winched out of the, the, the construction zone. And eventually, they ended up right outside pit 91 where we, we have started to excavate them. And the excavation of the first box, box one, began in August 2008. Coming out of these boxes are the usual cast of characters, saber-toothed cats, direwolves, horses, camels, ground sloths. But they do have yielded um, some, some interesting fossils that weren't found previously. For example, there are whole whole um, what are things? millipedes uh, preserved, uh, fragile bird skulls, insect heads, uh, rafts of oak leaves, insects with their original color, coloration on the, their wing cases. And by looking at these deposits, we find, in fact, there are four different kinds of deposits. There are horizontal asphalt accumulations, vertical fossil accumulations, some fossils that were secondarily impregnated with asphalt, and some fossils that really had nothing to do with the asphalt at all. Um, box 5B is an example of a horizontal deposit. Uh, you've got a, a thin layer of asphalt packed with bones. And the bones, in, and this is about 43,000 years old, and the bones include those of a camel, a Pacific rattlesnake, a long-tailed weasel, and as well as the usual cast of other cast of characters, um, saber-toothed cats and dire wolves, and so on. But the interesting thing about this deposit is that although carnivores, again, were the most common, uh, there were at least 25% of the bones coming out of here were rabbits and rodents, which is, wasn't the case from the earlier excavations. This, uh, these, these were, this horizontal deposit is how we envisage most of the um, asphaltic fossil accumulations started. You had asphalt spreading out over the surface and trapping fossils. But this uh, different kind of fossil deposit was found in box one. There you had a vertical pipe of bone. Um, you've got two, just in one corner, this is about a meter across. And that's what it looked like when we first started excavating it. it. The bones are sort of white because they've been exposed to the air and weather for two years before we started excavating. That's what it looks like after we've excavated a meter. And you can see the column of densely packed bones in asphalt surrounded by non-asphaltic sediment. 
Uh, and that looks what it looked like after we'd taken off the first meter, and that's going down into the ground. And you can see, again, densely packed bones, but only about a meter across. And this, this deposit was very interesting to us because it provided the first Panthera, <coughs> Panthera atrox or American lion skeleton. And this is a representation we had the uh, scapula at the top, underneath that was the skull, and there were various limb bones. And this was the first meter, and the second meter there were more bones, and there was a, a small Panthera atrox foot, uh, foot bone right at the bottom of the two meter deposit. Well, this is a bit of a conundrum because you've got a cylindrical pipe that's a meter across and two meters deep. And packed into that cylinder, cylinder are the, your Panthera atrox skeleton plus five adult smilodons, eight juvenile smilodons, a mountain lion, six adult direwolves, five juvenile direwolves, a gray wolf, a bobcat, and a juvenile bobcat, and remains of parts of Harlan's ground sloth, Shasta ground sloth, juvenile bison, two western horses, and two dwarf pronghorns. Now, this is only a meter across. These animals are much larger than that. So it's unlikely that they stood on top of one another to sink down into the asphalt. So we, this finding deposits like these has meant that we need to totally reevaluate how these fossil deposits are found. But an, an interesting thing is, again, carnivores were the most common elements found of the 12, th 12 to 14,000 bones that came out of this, this car. But 40% of those 14,000 bones were actually rodents and rabbit remains too. And we have here box 14, which is, is a similar situation. Instead of being a, a cylindrical pipe, it's a vertical fissure. It's only about a foot and a half wide, and it's, it's three or four feet long. And you can see the bones, again, are densely packed inside. And this deposit has yielded a juvenile mastodon, a, a, a bison, several saber-toothed cats, several dire wolves, some horse remains. And again, it's only one, one and a half feet wide. How the fossils got into that, or how they ended up in that sh configuration, is, is still to be worked out. But again, although carnivores are the, large, uh, the, the, the commonest large mammals, in this particular deposit, the carnivores are outnumbered by rodents and lagomorphs. Rodents and lagomorphs, uh, or rabbits, are more than 50% of the deposit. Then there were non asphaltic deposits. And this was very exciting for us because in these non asphaltic deposits, we found our first skeleton of a mammoth from Rancho La Brea. We had remains of some 35 other individuals, but just isolated bones and jaws. And here we have, for the first time, a skeleton. And here, here it's just tusks, and these are various parts of the body um, wrapped up in plaster for transportation to the museum. This is a map of the, the site. The bones in red are are left bones, uh, those in right are, and green are right, and those in blue are center. So you have the left and right tusks, uh, the lower jaw, the front legs here, the rib cage and ribs, the pelvis, and the, the one of the hind legs. The only bone that's way out of place is the skull. And you'll recall that it, it elephants like and mammoths have lots of air spaces in their skulls so that um, they tend to float if they're in rivers and they would have floated out of position. Well, the interesting thing was that this was found in a non-asphaltic matrix. Um, this is the kind of gray-green river clay and sand. Uh, that there is, is a small gopher skull. This is the skull, and you, this is the matrix around the skull. There's no asphalt in the matrix, and yet, most of the bones have got asf are impregnated with asphalt. So this is a question, how did these bones get impregnated with, with asphalt? There are, I guess, basically two solutions. Either the, the mammoth got trapped in a tar seep and then was washed out of it, or, and probably more likely, the, the mammoth actually died in a river channel 
and water in the f flowed past in the river, and floating on the river was oil, and the oil wicked itself into the bones. Well, that's our story. Um, okay, and then uh, just as, as, as a last, as non-asphaltic, we have associated with the Project Twenty Three area the, in the in the art museum excavation some fossil trees. Now these fossil trees look as though they, they died yesterday, um, but they are in fact between 25 and 55,000 years old, and they have well-preserved rings. And this is interesting because the, you can analyze the rings to provide all sorts of information. And in modern juniper trees, you note that the carbon content of the rings varies greatly because of changes, periodic changes in the soil water. And these changes aren't as well uh, demonstrated in junipers from higher elevations where you've got um, wetter and cooler conditions. And this, this is, okay, this, these are high elevation modern, ju modern junipers from wetter and cooler conditions. And here are rings from some of those La Brea trees. And you can see these are almost flatlined in contrast to these. It's not until 14,500 years ago that you start getting the, the kind of variation that you get even in modern high elevation. So this means that for much of the, the interval between 50,000 and 16,000 years ago, um, the area of La Brea was, was cool and dry, uh, cool and wet, sorry. The isotopic composition of the, the plants also indicates that the plants were under severe climatic stress because of low atmospheric carbon. Now you have to realize that during the peak of the last ice age, about 20,000 years ago, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was lower than it had ever been in the, in the previous 200, 000, 200 million years. And if you put modern plants in, into carbon dioxide like that, you'll find that they, gr they don't grow very well and they, they f often fail to reproduce. And so if these atmospheric conditions were there present back, back um, 20,000 years ago when the La Brea fossils were being, deform were being formed, this means um, that you know, th th there was low pro pl plant productivity which meant less food for the herbivores, which would tend to stress the entire population. And this may perhaps be contributing to the end Pleistocene extinction, which happened about 11,000 years ago. 11,000 years ago, most of the large mammals of North America, the mammoths, the mastodons, the horses, the camels, and the, the carnivores that fed on them became extinct. Uh, coyote and smaller sized mammals persisted, um, but the, the larger, the megafauna became extinct. And there are various theories that have been put forward to explain this. Um, and they center around, I guess, four main ideas. One, climate change. And we do know that at the end of the last ice age, uh, the climate warmed up very rapidly, and this would have stressed the, the, the plant populations and, and, um, and so on. But uh, you have to remember also that during the last two million years, there were at least 10 episodes where the earth became very cool and then very warm again, and then warmed up afterwards. And it's only during the last of these episodes, the, the, the 10th warming episode, that the large mammals became extinct. So environmental changes by themselves are probably not the answer. So what was different between the last warming episode and the preceding ones? And there are three possible differences. One, of course, is the arrival of humans. Uh, one is the arrival of bison into North America. And there's a, there has been a theory that a large um, comet exploded over the Great Lakes region and resulted in wildfires throughout North America. Um, 
unfortunately, at least some of the traces that were supposed to be carbon are from wildfires from this asteroid ended up uh, as being interpreted as algae. So probably this, this theory doesn't um, have much to contribute. But the arrival of humans and the arrival of bison does. But by themselves, probably not enough to cause the extinction of everything, but in combination with um, a period of time when the plants were in very low growth, um, and you suddenly had the arrival of, of, a, of a large herbivore, which would tend to convert grass, uh, forest into grasslands, and the arrival of, of humans, which would added another carnivore to, to the carnivore guild of the late Pleistocene, probably a combination of all those factors contributed to the end Pleistocene extinction. Uh, I arrived at the Page Museum some 30 odd years ago, at least I arrived at the Natural History Museum and they said don't bother with Rancho La Brea because it's all been done. And the last 30 years have, <laughs> have indicated to me that nothing could be further from the truth and we still have lots to go. We have to find out, for example, how these got fossils got preserved in the first place and we still have a lot of information to be gained from studying the remains and to try and figure out how, uh, how uh, and when uh, climate changes affected the late Pleistocene biota. I end up by, by uh, just saying a few words of, about Mr. George Page, who, after whom the Page Museum was, ma was named. Uh, George Page was, was raised in Nebraska, and at age 16, he ran away from home to California because he'd seen oranges and thought a place with oranges couldn't be all that bad. And he, he became a millionaire by investing in, in uh, real estate and mission pack and, and so on. And he went to, in 1975, he went to the county of Los Angeles and said, I will build you a museum for the tar pits. And they said, yeah, thank you very much. And then he built the museum and he handed over to the Natural History Museum and they said, well, I'm sorry, but we don't have the money to pay for th any exhibits. So he raised the money for the exhibits too. And uh, we're very fortunate that, that uh, he thought of us. And so um, that's the George C. Page Museum today. You can see it's sunny. There are <laughs> the temperatures are warm. It was 80 degrees when I left yesterday. And uh, I know s at least some of, of you will be coming down to SVP in Los Angeles. But those of you who, who aren't coming to SVP in, Lo in Los Angeles, I do invite you to come down and see the Page Museum because you can see for yourself um, this vast array of fossils that we have uh, from the, the last uh, 50,000 years. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.